Now, you've mentioned a couple of times, Ian, his his years in England. And it seems very clear from the book that those were critical years in in really developing his thought. And they led, of course, to the um, the Lettre Philosophique. So what was he, what were his sort of intellectual preoccupations during during that time? Well, one, one of the, the frustrating things about writing this book for that period is how little we know really in detail about what he did in England. Almost all the best information about Voltaire's life comes from his letters because he was a prolific uh, letter writer. I mean, he wrote 15,000 letters that mm. we have. He m- must have written more t- as well, but t- so it, for most of his life, there's a fantastic amount of detailed information you get week by week, day by day. But in England, there are long periods of months and weeks where there, there are no letters at all. So we're very much guessing what he, how he spent his time. But his purpose, or one of his purposes, in going to England was actually to to publish there the the epic poems that he'd written about uh, the French king uh, Henri IV, Henry IV, and the reason why he wanted to why he'd written this epic poem, it was to celebrate the fact that Henry IV had brought an end to the wars of religion in France between Catholics and Protestants. I mean, and it's for a period, there was a sort of a truce under the so-called Edict of Nantes, and it didn't last. I mean, towards the end of the reign of Louis XIV, the following century, it had been scrapped, and and the Protestants were again being persecuted. He, so he couldn't publish this this uh, epic poem celebrating Henri IV in France, mm. because of course it was a poem which is explicitly criticising. French government policy towards the Protestants. But he knew he could get it published in England because England was a country of relative liberty. So his main purpose in going to England was to arrange for the publication of his poem about Henri IV. But it was very soon after he got there that he realized that England, apart from being a place that you could get stuff published, was a most extraordinarily different country. And one of the things we probably don't realize is how strange England was to France and Mm. how strange people didn't travel very much. And there wasn't a wide amount of knowledge in France about England uh, or vice versa. Mm. And so quite quickly after he got there, one of the letters, the first letters that he wrote to a friend in France was to say, you know, I will, one day I will write about this very strange country. And indeed, that that was the main uh, result of his trip to England. And it it took him seven years to write this book. As you say, it's called The Lettre Philosophique, or sometimes it's called The Letters Concerning the English Nation. And some people think that it was largely, partly or even largely written originally in English, because Mm. he became extremely fluent in English. And this was the book which, when it came out, was ostensibly about all about the, the, the peculiarities of English society. Mm. But of course, indirectly, it was a backhanded attack on so many of the, the defects and the illiberalities of French society. Mm. Now, if we, if we fast forward, Ian, several decades, the same concerns with tolerance and, and pluralism that you see in the, in the Lettre Philosophique are manifest when, in his late 60s, Voltaire becomes what we could anachronistically call, uh, I suppose, a human rights campaigner. So what was, what, what was it that, that animated him um, then in, in his late 60s to become a, a public intellectual g- engaging in legal debate and conflict? Yeah, well, it's, it's a very, very interesting question. It isn't one that I think that anyone has got a good answer to. My answer falls into... Uh, two parts. The first is that when he went into exile, he was he was forced into exile on his return from from Prussia in 1753-54, um, and he went to live just outside Geneva. And he basically he acquired for the first time in his life a home of his own, a house with servants and a sort of a stable, permanent place. To begin with, he was living in a small house 
relatively small house just outside Geneva. But after five years, he moved to a much larger establishment, an estate at Ferney, just across across the French border, which was a, a castle, you know, with a, a village and a farm and lots of fields and so on. And from that moment, he suddenly became responsible for an estate and responsible for the well-being of all the people in it. Mm. And it is quite extraordinary. This is a guy who, for 60 years, um, had really shown no concern for anybody else, certainly no concern for anybody in the lower orders, no concern for justice or human rights. He'd just been interested in his friends, his comfort, his career, and the intellectual things he was working on, his books and his plays and so on. And then suddenly, he buys this, this uh, estate at Fernay, and he starts to write about it. He, he goes to visit it even before he's finalized the contract for it. And you, certainly, you, you suddenly see this man coming alive and saying how incredibly poor these people are, how neglected the place has been. And from that moment on, he's absolutely obsessed with developing the estate and uh, alleviating the poverty of the people on it. So for, from that point on, his whole attitude towards other people, to his own moral responsibility, changed radically. And it was in the wake of that, that one day he heard about a Protestant in Toulouse who had, had been arrested on suspicion that he had strangled his son in order to prevent this son from converting to Catholicism. This guy called Jean Calas, he was arrested. There was no evidence of any kind. It was just rumor. He was tortured and he was killed in the most brutal, disgusting way. And again, you suddenly you can, you can just see in the letters Voltaire changing because he hears about this event and he, he has a, a throwaway line of a very supercilious kind. Oh, you know, the, the Protestants are not much good, are they? Blah, blah, blah. And then a few days later, he writes another letter in which he's, you can see he's, he's actually he's trembling with anxiety. His moral sense has suddenly been awoken. He thinks, by God, this man was innocent. There was no proof against him. And he spent the next three years campaigning to have the, the sentence quashed and reversed. Eventually, he succeeded, and the, and the king actually gave um, the, his, the, the, the widow and the children uh, you know, financial compensation. I mean, hopeless, but still. Mm. And from that moment on, Voltaire became more and more transfixed with these stories of injustice, first with particular injustices, and then more and more with the general system, the, the way it seems that the system seemed to, to, to go for injustice in spite of itself. It, they believed in torture, the whole thing was conducted in secret, uh, you know, there was no transparency about the legal system at all. So for about 10 years or more, he was thoroughly busy. Of course, he was a man who was never busy on one thing at once, you know, mm. he was doing looking after the estate in the morning and writing plays in the afternoon and writing letters to his lawyers and campaigning. I mean, he was absolutely tireless. But um, he became, it, it, this, these cases, starting with Jean Carlos, were the ones which completely transformed his image in France with the popular, pe or the ordinary people. And he became known, he became known as the man of the Calas because he had, he challenged the law courts, he'd challenged the regime, he'd challenged the king, and he'd won his way. Mm.